this is a project that we've been working on for a long time. And it finally came to fruition when I, I came to um, Satara just about a year ago now, um, a year ago tomorrow, actually. Um, and it came about as a result of a grant from the FDA who is interested in developing machine learning methods for model selection, um, uh, mostly in conjunction with model-based bioequivalence studies as an objective way to develop models for bio simulated bioequivalence studies. Um, but the method is, is general. It can really be applied to any um, uh, any kind of model selection um, with some limitations. But the result is a, a Python package called PyDarwin. It is an open source, all Python solution. Um, at the moment specific for non-mem, but um, uh, the capabilities will be continued expanding. And there is the, the, the GitHub repo for it. Again, it's open source, anyone can download it. Um, the installation is quite straightforward. Um, and again, it was developed under a grant and in collaboration with the FDA. We meet with the FDA frequently on uh, how this is progressing and at this point, really how it's going to be integrated into model-based bioequivalent studies. The PyDarwin itself is really completely general. You can, anything that you can consider doing in non-MEM, you can search for in PyDarwin. Um, com compartments, covariates, random effects, between occasion variabilities. Um, new referencing is a little bit hard we have not yet found anything that you cannot do um, in non-MEM, in Python Darwin that you can do in non-MEM. We originally started with just one algorithm, genetic algorithm, which is where the name Darwin came from, but we have since then expanded to a, a six different algorithms, five machine learning algorithms, plus exhaustive search. And these are Bayesian optimization with a Gaussian process and random forest, random tree with gradient boost, genetic algorithm, and most recently, particle swarm optimization. All of these algorithms start with a search space, and they all basically code a search space in a very similar way. The search space um, for model selection is in many ways analogous to the parameter search space. There are multiple dimensions. In the case of the parameter search space, the dimensions include the, the real valued, um, variables for volume and clearance and KA and lag time and whatever else. In the case of model search space, it's not a continuous search space, it's a discrete search space. Um, but there are multiple dimensions. Dimensions include how many compartments and whether there's a lag time and whether there are relationships between weight and volume or, or um, weight and clearance, whether there are off diagonal omega elements. And all of those get coded in this discrete search space. And again, all of these six algorithms define the search space in the same way. And so the, the, the underlying mechanism of how these models get executed is identical for all six algorithms. The key differences in searching the parameter space in non-MEM and searching the model, model candidate model search space in PyDarwin is that the, the search space in non-MEM is real valued, continuous variables, and so it has a derivative. Um, and the derivative is used for the optimization in the case of the, the first order, first order conditional methods. There is no derivative in a, in a discrete search space. It's, there's no um, uh, slope between one compartment and two compartments. And so one has to look at different algorithms. And there are a lot of algorithms developed over the years for searching discrete search spaces. And we looked at all of them that we could find and, and tried to decide which of them were feasible for implementing in this for this problem and came up with those six. For discrete search space, we are looking for an optimal combination of choosing one option from each dimension in the same way that we're looking for one value for volume and one value for clearance and one value for lag time that results in the optimal um, minus twice the log likelihood for none of them. Dimensions might be, for example, the number of compartments, one or two or three the elimination mechanism, linear mechanics metan or combined linear mechanics metan or TMDB, the absorption model, linear zero order transit compartments with or without absorption, um, lag time, covariates, all possible combinations or user-defined relationships, different residual error models, different omega structures, off diagonal omega structures, and importantly, also being able to search on initial estimates. I probably frequently overlooked component of the search space is that um, it's, it's in, to ensure robustness, it's frequently important that you start the search from the non-MEM search um, from different initial estimates. 
and that can be incorporated into this as, a, as dimensions in this discrete search space. In thinking about defining this search space, the actual number of candidate models into it, it increases exponentially or as a power function. For example, something fairly straightforward, if you're looking at one or two or three compartments and linear or michaelis metten or combined elimination and different absorption models, different residual error models, different between subject variability, covariates, all of the above, you end up with an intractable number of models to look at all of them. If the search space is small, you can, and we, we do this not infrequently. We will look at all possible combinations, um, but for most real world problems, it's not feasible to do an exhaustive search and look at all possible combinations of all of these different features. So we define this, this discrete search space, and then rather than looking at all possible combinations, we use algorithms to hopefully efficiently and hopefully robustly search it. Again, we started with a genetic algorithm, and, and, but the way that the search space is defined and the way that the, the definition of the search space gets translated into a syntactically correct non-mem control file is pretty much the same. We generate a bit string of zeros and ones. Um, for example, here's an example bit string of zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, et cetera. And the first two bits comprise the gene for the number of compartments where zero, zero defines the one compartment, zero, one defines two compartment defined as K23 and K32, and one, zero, two compartment parameterized as Q and volume of steady state, and one, one defines two compartments as Q and V2. We then have little chunks of code that get dropped into a template file that specify these different options. And it's just text for one compartment, it's going to be advent two, for two compartments, it's going to be advent four, perhaps. And we assemble from that a syntactically correct non-mem control file. It's a standard non-mem control file. It looks like any other non-mem control file that you would generate. And then we run it. And we string together all these bits defining all these genes for all these different effects that we're interested in looking at. We then run those models. And we um, some work, many don't. And we get um, a summary statistics out of it objective function value, how many thetas, um, whether it converged, whether it did a covariance step, and then we, we have a feedback loop from those outcomes, which we define as being relatively good, relatively bad, and we use those that outcome, this calculated fitness or the goodness of fit, the cost, the reward, and we use that to select new models to run. And that's how we, we continuously improve this model using each of these different algorithms. And this is all handled by PyDarwin. You don't have to worry about any of this. All you have to do is specify which of these options you want to, to incorporate into the search space. The definition of the search space, the assigning of the bits to the different genes and the, the corresponding text, sorting them, assembling the control files, running the control files, getting the feedback, and selecting the new models is all handled by PyDarwin. So a little more, a little more granular on exactly what this is doing. All of these algorithms use a couple of key files. First is the template file. The template file looks a lot like a non mem control file on the left here, except there are these little strings of text. For example, um, curly brace V2 is a function of weight one, and um, curly brace V2 is a function of weight two. Those get replaced by text specified in another file called the tokens file. The tokens file is a JSON file which is a fairly user-friendly, human-readable file format that specifies that the text that's to be dropped into this template file for each value of this bit string. Uh, for example, if the bit string specifies a one for the effect here of, of um, volume as a function of gender, you end up dropping this text times exp gender times data to the function of gender in here. Oops. And the other, the other text, the initial estimates, down into the, the um, dollar theta block. If you specify zero for that, then you end up putting nothing, just a blank string in here and here. And this way, you take these, these zeros and ones, and you use them to construct a, um, a non-mem control file that specifies that model. Again, this is completely general. These files are user-defined. You can put anything you want in there. 
Um, and, and again, we have not yet found something that we cannot do um, in Pi Darwin that's legal in non men So again, all these algorithms use the same coding, the same bit string or integer string of, of the specification of the model. Um, and they all use the this, this same approach, but there's important differences between the algorithms. Machine learning algorithms in general are divided classically into supervised and unsupervised learning. Supervised algorithms use a training set. Um, this is what's done with, with um, uh, image recognition and audio um, uh, digital signal processing, where there is a, a training set where you have a, several thousand pictures of dogs and cats, and you code them as a bit string, a, a bitmap. And the algorithm looks for patterns in the bit string that suggest that this is a dog or this is a cat. And then you can take those, the, the model that comes out of that and present it with a new image, a new bit string, and it will predict whether that's actually a dog or a cat. And it, it works fairly well. We're pretty good at doing image recognition, doing that. Unsupervised learning has no training set. Each problem is new. And that's what model selection is um, in non men We don't have a training set with, of a thousand different data sets that we know to be one compartment, a thousand training sets we know to be two compartment, and we look for patterns in the data sets that suggest that. Each problem is a new problem, and you take those data and you look for patterns just in those data. So traditional non-MEM model selection is unsupervised. Of the algorithms we've incorporated, um, only genetic algorithm, um, and actually, I need to change the slide, um, particle swarm optimization is also an unsupervised algorithm. But there's been a lot of interest recently in, uh, in what are sort of hybrid algorithms, generally called reinforcement learning algorithms. And in these algorithms, which include are this limitation of Bayesian optimization and random forest and gradient boosted random tree, you start without a training set um, and you randomly generate dozens or maybe a hundred models and you run them. And these are just noise, just completely random numbers. You generate a hundred random non mem control files and you run them. Many of them won't work. Many of them will crash or they will just be really bad models. But now you have a training set. And you can train on that training set. And, that, and so you do that. And now you have a, a, a little bit better idea of what this objective, this um, fitness surface looks like. And based on that current model, that training set, you pick models that are now informative. Sometimes you pick the best models and sometimes you pick models um, that are exploratory, that are outside and there are built in algorithms for, for figuring out how much of this should be um, exploitation, looking for you, you know, what you currently predict is the best, best model and what should be exploitation. Thinking about how we're looking outside what we currently think is the best model, looking for new models outside that space. And that's all handled internally by these algorithms as well, with some hyperparameters. Um, and now you want to generate another 100 models based on this train, very small training set. And now you have 200 models as a training set and you retrain the algorithm on those models. And that's the, 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 the approach behind these hybrid um, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. And they work pretty well. But what we found is with all these algorithms is that they are very good at finding generally good models. But there are assumptions built into all of them, except the exhaustive search. For example, the Bayesian optimization assumes that this whole thing is a big multivariate um, normal probability distribution. That's what the Gaussian process name comes from. It's assumed that it's multivariate normal probability distribution. But those of us who've been doing this for a while know that's not true. These um, objective functions and, and just the goodness of the model can change unexpectedly, especially when it comes to converging and covariance. You make a small change that makes the model a little bit better, but now suddenly, um, it converges and it does a covariance test um, and it passes a correlation test. And if um, uh, those are important considerations in your model selection, suddenly the model gets a whole lot better. And that's a deviation from this assumed smooth, normal, uh, multivariate normal probability distribution. And none of these algorithms handle that very well. And so what we found is that these algorithms are very good at doing a global search, looking for generally good models, but they're fairly bad at sort of finding the last one or two little changes that result in the best model. So we have um, combined 
these global search algorithms with a local search, um, local search not unlike what humans do when they when they do models. You make one change at a time, you see if the model gets better. If it gets better, you keep it and you make another change. If it doesn't get better, you reject it and go do something else. And we found that's actually a very robust solution for um, a, a combining a very robust global search and getting that last few changes in the uh, in the model that resulted in the best model. And further, we have recently found that it works even better or provides an even more robust solution if you do a two-bit local search. And this is an interesting observation that the, the one-bit local search changes one bit at a time. And for example, if you have 40 bits in this bit string, you would try, hey, you have 40 new models to try. Change each bit, flip bit from zero to one or one to zero. Um, but further expanding on the, the complexity of this search space, um, sometimes it's not strictly downhill, and sometimes you have to make two changes at once to find a better model. And we have found this actually fairly frequently, that this two-bit local search, where you make every possible two-bit change in the search space, in the bit string, um, results in a much more robust search. The downside is that this is very computationally demanding. The, um, for one bit, uh, a one-bit search, where n is the number of bits in the string, you have n new models to try. For two-bit change, you have n squared minus n divided by two. So it's, it's computationally very demanding, um, but it does increase robustness if it's uh, feasible from a, from a computational load perspective. And that brings up, what do we mean by a good model? Um, I think when all of us develop models, we have a a pretty good idea of what we mean by a good model. We'd like to converge, typically. We, we I think, all believe the minus twice log likelihood objective function value is an important criteria for a good model. And I think we typically add penalties. The log likelihood ratio test specifies that 3.84 points in the objective function value uh, is statistically significant for one degree of freedom. And therefore, that's an appropriate penalty for um, uh, to add for as a parsimony penalty for thetas. We generally like models to converge. We generally like a covariance step. Um, models that have a successful covariance step are generally considered to be better than models that don't. We like to have a correlation test and the condition number less than 1,000. In addition, we have provided an opportunity to include user-defined R code or Python code to be run after each model to provide user-defined penalties. And this was um, important for the work with a model-based bioequivalent because it's typically very important in those models, model development, to find a model that accurately reproduces the CMAX and the AUC. And the CMAX in particular is typically fairly insensitive to the objective function value or any of these tests. And if you really want a model to capture the the CMAX correctly, you're probably going to have to specifically ask it to do that. And we do that by running a PPC test after the model is run and, and providing a, a penalty in this goodness of fit statistic for, for missing the CMAX. But you can do anything you want. You can pull anything you want out of non-mem output, the relative standard errors, the post hoc data values, anything that you think is important for defining a good model, you can um, incorporate into the the model search criteria by um, providing R code or Python code to run after each model is run. Uh, all the models are saved. Um, they are all listed. Um, by default, only the, um, the F messages and the output file and the list file and the XML file are saved. And there's also a JSON file that is saved that is, is human readable. Uh, it can be used to restart the, pot, the model if, the, if the, your power goes off. Um, the, all these are saved and you can use them to restart the model. Um, as well as just read the file um, at the end and figure out which, which models might be uh, appropriate for further exploration manually. Um, again, this is, this is on, on GitHub. Here's, this is the link to the documentation. There are a, a number of examples um, available. Uh, it's free, it's all open source. Uh, Python is open source, the package is open source. The only thing one has to, to pay for is non-mem. 
Um, and there is the a link to the documentation. The biggest downside to this is the learning curve. The command line interface, which is what you get with just the Python with PyDarwin, is not trivial. Um, here's the, an example of a template file, which isn't too bad. You do have these tokens, the, the um, curly brace advan one, not too bad. The cumbersome demanding part is the tokens file. The JSON file, which is human readable, but it's very rigidly defined. All of these curly braces and quotation marks and commas and square braces all have to be in the right place. Um, you can't have comments. It doesn't recognize white space. So if you want a new line, for example, you have two thetas that you need to provide initial estimates for. You have to specify that as a backslash n. Tabs have to be specified as backslash t. And it's just not very user friendly. Um, we do it. Um, we've been doing it for a long time. And this is how we do most of our searches. But to facilitate um, uh, the learning curve, we have uh, ported this into a, a graphical user interface um, attached to the latest version of Piranha. Um, so while PyDarwin is open source, command line, um, uh, it's really sort of, for those of you who have been doing this for a long time, um, comparable to the pre-NM Tran implementation of non-NEM. Again, if you've been doing this for a long time, the original implementation of non-NEM was Fortran code. And NM Tran, NM Translator, um, came around and made that much, much easier in the same way um, Piranha um, with Darwin provides the graphical user interface to create to facilitate creation of these files, the template file, the tokens file, and a third file, the options file, um, in a, a point-and-click drop-down menu and environment. And here's a link to the Prana documentation that um, implements this, um, as well as all the other functionality in um, Piranha. And with that, I'm going to go to a quick demo of how to do this in Piranha. Uh, this is the Piranha interface. And we have, a, for those of you who are Piranha users, we've added this new model type called Darwin. And we're going to create a new model. And this is sort of the initial dialogue for it. And just basic information, who's the author, uh, name the search, what algorithm do you want to use? We're just going to be using GA. Number of generations, number of models in each generation. This can be a very, very simple search. Normally, you would have more generations and more models per generation, but we'll start with this. There's a runtime for timing out non-mem. Um, non-mem can run forever sometimes, and as if, if you ever want to finish, you do have to provide a timeout uh, for models that just tend to run forever. They are by default run at low priority or below normal priority, so the, your, your interface remains responsive while this is running in the background. You start, you start by selecting a data set. And this is a simulated data set that is pretty standard. Um, there is some functionality for um, automatically identifying the covariates, you know, the, the, the data items in the data set, and it doesn't always work completely correctly. But um, so we'll fix this a little bit. We need clearance, and we need And then here are the options for the, the, the advans. And version one, we only have the, the algebraic advans available. The ODE solutions are not yet available um, to interface with Piranha. So we have advan one, two, three, four, 11, and 12. I'm only going to do, I know this is oral dosing. Um, so I'm only going to do advan two and advan four. And then the covariates that were selected are available to be related to the, the parameters in each of these. And I'm going to select all of these, allowing each of these covariates to be a predictor of each of the parameters in those two um, advans. And then you go to the advan, and you always have to have the required uh, parameters, but we're going to also search for a lag time. 
what this means is that the, the options for the optional parameters are they're either not there ever, they're always there, or they're searched. Search means that it will include that in the bit string. There will be a zero or a one for whether the, the absorption lag time is included in this model. And similarly for omegas, for any parameter, they can be present or not present or searched. Same thing, zero or one if they're searched, there'll be a zero or one in the bit string to um, uh, specify whether that uh, um, omega, that eta is included in this control file. And we're going to, I think we're gonna have present for Ka, but searched, uh, so present for clearance, searched for Ka, and present for volume and searched for lag time. And you do need to come up with, with um, fairly intelligent initial estimates. Uh, okay, one, one, uh, lag time is zero, one. And I'm gonna make all of the initial estimates for omega point, point three. And that's correct. Now do pretty much the same thing for advent four. Zero point two five a one two uh, zero point two. I think volume zero. And again, I always want a ADA on clearance, but search for it on KA. Search for it on Q, always press on B2, but search for on B3. And then again with lag, I'll search for a lag time. It's, it's not just 0 0.1, and I'll search for the KA on that. I think that's correct. And the next step is to define the covariate relationships that you want to search for. And this is a little bit tedious. We only have three and um, two ad bands, so um, with more, it would take even longer. But I am going to do an allometric scaling, a power model for clearance and volume, and they will be searched for. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do a weight on ka but i'm going to search for it on volume and initial estimates of the usual elementary scaling um i'm not going to search for it on lag time and in clearance i'm really only hypothesizing that that's present on clearance we have none for these and search here and yeah an exponential model for creatinine clearance on clearance in sex. I really don't have any prior on that, so I'm going to search for it on everything. And yeah, exponential makes sense. And then the same thing here. Um, clearance is going to be search for power model. No, 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 let's see. Wait on K, I'm going to search for that. Um, search for this again, power model. B2, search power model. And I'm not going to search for the lag time. Okay, does that look right? Search, search, search. Search, no presence. Okay. Credit and clearance, same thing. I'm really only hypothesizing that that's present on clearance. If you can reasonably, it's present on KA or volume. And that's, yeah, going to be an exponential model with initial estimate of a small initial estimate, small positive initial estimate. And sex, again, search and everything. Nope, no prior on that. Okay. 
and yeah, there's a problem with the rest of it. Let's see if that all makes sense, see what I've missed. Okay, I think that looks correct. Um, also going to put in some additional code to um, make post hoc estimates that I have prepared somewhere here. Because um, I want to make plots in the end. And that's not included by default. So I'm just going to paste this in so I can make exposed plots. Um, just weight clearance sex for covariates and standard plots. Um, usual um, uh, conditional method interaction, usual stuff there. And sigma is initial estimates, and we use all the defaults, native error of one, portion error of 0.2. The downhill step. You have the option of running the downhill step either or um, at every n, n generations. We typically run it every five iterations. So we'd run genetic algorithm for five generations and then do the, the downhill step, one bit and or two bit search downhill. Um, that would be run periodically. Um, in the time, we're just gonna run this at the end of the search. Um, uh, and again, you can do the one or two bit search. The number of niches is the starting point for the downhill search. And the default here is two niches, meaning they'll start at two points. And the niche radius is how many bits different those two points in the search space have to be. So they have to be different by at least two bits, which is appropriate because this whole search space only has about 10 bits, I think. So this will start a downhill search at two different places, and those two different places are different by at least two bits. The penalties, I'm going to use all the default penalties, um, but you can define these, everyone, if you don't care about it, if you're in the, the camp that doesn't care about covariance step, doesn't think it means anything, you can set this to zero. Uh, if you don't care if it converges, you can set that to whatever you want. Um, all the other, um, all the other um, usual penalties, um, depending on the, the user's preference, there's a small penalty for um, non-influential uh, tokens. There are cases that arise where, for example, if you have nested tokens, where you have Q as a function of weight, but you only have a one compartment model, there is no Q, and so that token doesn't have any influence. And there's a very small penalty for that just to make sure that's not your final model when it compares um, a model with that effect and without that effect. Um, we're not running any R code post uh, after the, the, the run. And GA, all the default GA, these are some of the hyperparameters for genetic algorithm. Um, this elitism where you carry over four models to the next generation by default. The um, crossover frequency, the mutation frequency, the penalty for being in, in a, a niche to maintain diversity in the population. Um, you can use all the defaults for that. And that comprises defining the model. And so now we have this model defined and it's just a matter of running it. And use a default Darwin profile, which specifies things like um, how many uh, cores you're going to use to run it. And, and uh, the default here is four, because I'm just running this on my laptop, it only has four cores, um, the name of the search directory and things like that. But uh, if you're familiar with Piranha, you know that it runs non-mem from command line, and it does the same thing with, um, with PyDarwin. It just generates those two files, the template files, the token files, and the options file, and then runs it from the command line. And it goes through this and looks for all the things it needs. Um, it makes sure that the folders are there, and makes sure the data set is there, uh, make sure the NMFB is there. We're not running our code. If, if we were running our code, make sure the R code is there and that our script is present. Um, important thing is that um, you need to provide the path for, for NMFE. In this case, it's in, in, it's in NM74G64 util. And as usual, the first few models crash, at least that's my experience, but then they start doing something reasonable. And this number is the fitness value, 286. And that is the composite of minus twice the log likelihood for that model, plus all these penalties that we specified. I'll let this run for a couple of minutes. 
it does capture um, the it, it captures the prediction error messages as well as the the console output from NMTRAN, um, and you know you get the usual messages about um, NMTRAN for this is population data, and that's not important, so we don't list that out. But the, there's this error that came from the prediction error file that are root of the character's equation is zero, and it gives you a summary of those. Um, many of these crash frequently as usual, but as it goes on, it will um, convert on a, a model and let it run one generation here, and then we'll do some plotting. Okay, so that's done the first generation. And we told it to always save the four best models so you don't lose them. And these are the four best models that it already ran. Um, it ran in NMO, uh, the um, generation zero model 11, which is right there. And that's the best model. It saved the four best models. And then it generates, um, in this case, 11 new models based on um, uh, what looks good, the crossed over the mutation rate, um, and then it starts running those. But while that's running, we're going to um, do a little plotting for not leaving just for sort of credibility. And the models are all saved. That was model 11. And there's the, there's the, the model, and here's the control file that it generated. But we can take this model and do sort of the usual things with it. The first issue that you'll notice is that all that it saves is the output file and the XML file and the messages file. If we didn't do that, it would quickly fill up your disk. You're running hundreds or sometimes thousands of models. And if you're saving all the SD tab, et cetera, models from that, you're going to be using a lot of disk space. And we'll, we'll address that in the next version where we'll save any table files from key models. But currently, we have to rerun this model to regenerate those um, SD tab, et cetera, models. And so we'll just quickly rerun this, just using Piranha. Now, we have all of the files, the SD tab files down there. And we can start making some plots, just some basic um, plotting functionality. Um, in the data inspector, we can just open this file and make you know, basic plots of, of DB versus pred, unity line. It generates the R code down here if you want to use that um, using uh, base R. And you can make some basic plots, to just sort of a quick reality check time versus prediction. Um, but there's also um, sort of publication ready plotting available. Um, if you go to, oh, you see the estimates, all the estimates there, you can, you can look at those and the standard errors, et cetera. But there are also scripts here, built-in scripts, and we're gonna run some exposed plots. Um, let's just do the combined goodness of fit. We'll open that in R Shiny. And this is the code that's provided that the, um, the script code and it puts in the appropriate um, model files and folders and everything that you need to run it. There's a few things I need to change here. I, I don't want these output as PDF. I want to look at them. And I didn't say the I weight residual, so I'm not going to be able to make that plot. And so I can print those plots. 
Um, but I do want to make a combined plot for the basic goodness of pits. So then I want to um, combine all these plots into one. Sorry about that. What did I do? I seem to have lost R. Start again. Mark, maybe in the interest of time, um, I have some of this script that I can also show. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you want to kick it over to me and I can finish okay. up. Let me, yeah, let me just um, take out the stuff that won't run and we'll just run this basic one. And it makes the publication report ready plots um, from these scripts. And with that, I will send it over to James, who will go over some of the more reporting, more advanced reporting and plotting features available in Piranha. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Let me share my screen here. Let's see here. Okay, I trust everyone can see my piranha. All right, so uh, the example that Mark showed, um, we actually have available in our piranha online help. So if we go to our help here, user assistance, this brings us to the piranha homepage, and we can scroll down here uh, to the Darwin searches section and download this example zip file. So well, I already downloaded this Darwin examples zip file, extracted it here in my Piranha workspace. You can see I have the four examples. Example four is what Mark has just uh, demonstrated. So I'm gonna click into that folder. You see we have example four.darwin, um, which we can always just double click if we wanna edit the existing search, make any changes, um, such as you know, Mark had 15 number of models in every generation which um, does run faster, but typically you wanna increase that to number between you know, at least 20 or 30. Um, but everything else we saw is, is the same in this example. And I've run this example. We have the Darwin Search 01 folder that was created. Now I'm gonna go into output. And of course I'm in the Darwin extension, so I need to change that to mod. And we have our final control file that's available here. I just opened that up in my text editor. Um, again, as Mark mentioned, I did re-execute this model in order to generate, uh, regenerate these tables as we do not keep those tables. Um, and with that, let's take a look at some of the output. So uh, Mark showed in, in the presentation, the results CSV file, which I'm just going to open here in my spreadsheet. And that provides a nice, Kind of run summary here in tabular data. Um, arrange first by iteration and then the model number. Of course, these uh, are ordered in terms of when that model finished. So that's why some of this is out of sequence, but all models do have to finish before moving on to the next uh, iteration. And you can see the run directory here um, where you could find those uh, model files in that temp folder, associated fitness, Here's the model binary, objective function value, various columns that correspond to uh, penalty usage, um, number of thetas, omegas, sigmas, and then the condition number. And like many things, this is always better visualized, I would argue. So with that uh, in Piranha, 
anytime we have a Piranha scripts folder in our project directory, as you see I have here with this script, Darwin Fitness by Iteration, well, in the project directory, that makes that available in the scripts tab. If I go to scripts project, now I'm gonna select this script, Darwin Fitness by Iteration, run script. And that's gonna generate the following plot here. And this is a little bit easier to understand the path of the search than looking at the table, of course. So we could see we started with generation zero, the minimum fitness there, 437, um, stayed constant over two generations in the GA step. Uh, and then we started seeing improvements here through generations three through five. And here is when we hit the downhill search. And as Mark mentioned, this is the local exhaustive search. Um, typically where the best model is, is, is found. And it was found here in the final downhill step five. Um, and there were a few more iterations to uh, assess if there was a better model that could be found, but there was not a uh, final downhill. This model in final downhill seven essentially was a copy of the same model in, in the downhill five step. And you could see that I've referenced that here, um, the location of that model and the resulting fitness score. So that's kind of looking at, you know, some of the, the, the run, the Darwin search overview. But if we want to extend or report on this final best model, um, kind of given conventional piranha tooling, well, we can do just that. So we can select going back to our scripts. Let's look in our library. All these scripts are available um, to generate from our final model. So go ahead and take a look at DB versus PRED. It generates the following file. Now, if I really wanted to uh, fine tune these scripts um, inside the Shiny application model results, well, that's supported as well. So with the final model selected, I can go ahead and hit this hourglass, run model results. And it's going to initialize the Shiny application here. Bring that to my right screen. So we can see the, in Piranha, you can actually select multiple models to send them to model results. But here I just, uh, we can see from the tree here on the left, I have various, um, model diagnostic plots that I could select from, such as CW res versus PRED. There's a plot that I'm interested in, um, in reproducing or assembling into a report. Well, what I could do is simply tag it. Individual plots as well. I'm gonna go ahead and tag the individual plots. Can do a multi plot here, DV Preds versus Ivar. And we can also change various styling if we wanted to maybe shrink the points a little bit and tag that. And there's also um, various faceting options here in this application. So if we DV versus Pred, for example, if I wanted to go to the layout tab, I can facet this plot by, um, say, sex, for example, and we'll tag this plot. All right, so I've tagged some model diagnostics. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some tables. So just like we did for the model diagnostics, um, we can tag tables of interest or even further style them, remove columns if I wanted to maybe remove BIC from this table, um, order some of the columns around. I'm gonna go ahead and tag this. And we'll do a theta table as well. And our omega table.
So the act of tagging all these model diagnostics in the model result shiny application allows them to persist here in the tag tab and we can take a look at any of the individual diagnostics that we tagged, but also it generates the corresponding R code to reproduce this uh, from R Studio or the R command line. So uh, all the model diagnostic plots here we see are exposed with some ggplot customization. Um, all the tables, for example, are um, flex table. And with uh, any you know, kind of data pre-processing done uh, using dplyr. So I'm gonna go ahead and download this script of my model diagnostics. And additionally, I'm gonna click this report tab. You see that my tag diagnostics are here in this report container. So I'm just gonna drag over the ones of interest, overall theta, omega, dv versus pred. You can order them however you wish inside the report. And we'll do PDF output. Can select from PDF, HTML, or DOCX, and I'm going to hit download report. All right, so by default, I gave this report this name report, it's uh, the timestamp of the current date, and it tells me this report has been saved to Piranha Reports. So I'm just going to go ahead and exit the application, go back to Piranha. I see in my reports tab, I have this shiny node with my PDF report available in here, which I just opened that up. And we could see I've kind of generated on the fly a, a final report output based on this uh, final best model found from the Darwin search. And we have all our plots in here. And you may have seen inside that Shiny application, I could have additionally gen uh, downloaded the raw R markdown file. So if I want to bring this back into R Studio, maybe add additional text, um, uh, write summary information about the analysis, that can be done and then regenerated right inside R Studio. All right, I think we have five minutes left. I do want to um, go ahead and bring back the presentation and allow a little bit of time for questions. So just want to swap that. So just to uh, recap, you can find these Darwin examples here from Piranha Help, User Assistance, and here at the Darwin Searches. Uh, we do have various videos about using Piranha and Darwin. Uh, there, they can be found here at the following link. It's a Sartari University. And we are continuing to develop this tool. So development is active. We'll be starting um, on the next release here in the near future um, with the next release plan for Q4 of 2023. Um, some enhancements. Uh, we're improving the Darwin search interface with expanded search options, such as being able to search omega structure, functional form of covariate effects. Um, we're gonna be supporting NLME, so PML model syntax, um, supporting those models inside Darwin as well to uh, allow NLME usage with a Darwin search. Uh, we're going to be enhancing the reporting capabilities for Darwin search. Um, allowing you know, more flexibility to save various output tables for key best models and uh, generate um, more robust reports, both across the search and for the particular um, candidate models and final best model. And then we're also going to be expanding support for uh, grid workload managers in Piranha. So um, creating a generic grid workload manager page that uh, essentially would be able to support uh, alternative grid engines such as Slurm. So right now we support uh, SGE and Torque natively inside the Piranha interface. And with that, we'll go to uh, Sebastian and uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank you, James, for the great presentations. We indeed uh, have uh, questions. And as a reminder, please submit your questions through the chat pane, and we will address them. And uh, let me ask you the first question that came through. Um, 
is parameter identifiability considered in model selection? Dead. Not explicitly, no. Only to the extent that it is reflected in whether it converges and whether there's a covariance step. Um, it, it, it's far from public yet, but we are working with the FDA on on our code using something we're calling um, posterior predictive check with uncertainty. And the uncertainty, you end up paying a significant penalty for having parameters estimated with uncertainty in doing this PPC with uncertainty. So directly, no, but but functionally, yes. All right, thank you, Mark. And the second question that came through is a, a two-fold question. Um, does Piranha Darwin support grid execution? and what platforms and workload managers are supported? Uh, yes, it does. So uh, we've officially, so Piranha Darwin uh, officially tested on SGE and in terms of the kind of the remote host setup in Piranha, um, it's tailored for SGE. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, in terms of the uh, future enhancements, we will be improving uh, support for more generic um, grid workload setup to allow for alternative grid engine specifications um, and PyDarwin. Uh, so we officially support SGE for PyDarwin um, in terms of our QE testing uh, infrastructure. However, there's you know no reason why you cannot use Slurm or some other grid workload manager. Uh, you would just need to know, you know, the grid submission commands, the polling regular expressions uh, for the particular jobs. Um, and we have examples of all that for SGE, just not for any alternative uh, grid engines. So that is something that we'll be expanding support for uh, in the future. Okay, great. Thank you, James. And um, there was another question um, from the audience regarding the uh, recording. And um, yes, uh, we will send the recording of the webinar to you in the next um, couple of days. And yeah, feel free to re-watch re it. Feel free to share it internally. And of course, feel free to reach out to us if you have, if you have more questions. And with that, I think we can wrap it up for today. Thank you very much to the audience. Thank you very much for the interaction with the questions. And of course, thank you very much to Mark and James for a great presentation. Thank you, with everyone. With that, have a good day and take care. Bye.